So Tom, uh, from his own words, is a professor of pediatrics and interdisciplinary studies here at UBC. He is a pediatrician with specializations in epidemiology and population health. Uh, one tidbit that I have to share about Tom that I've just learned in the last month or so since I moved my office next door to his is that uh, after 5 o'clock when the only people left in the office are those of us who are trying to clean up a bit of email, uh, Tom plays the most inspirational music coming out of his office and it's really lovely to get those <laughs> last few emails done, so I appreciate it. Tom Boyd. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I want to talk with you today um, under the title, What the Genes Rem Remember, the New Epigenetics of uh, Early Life. We are discovering uh, within the field of human biology that genes actually do remember. They remember uh, things that happen in the remote recesses of our early life, um, which begins to be very important for uh, people and fields that want to understand how the, what the implications are of the kinds of experiences that children have, not only in very early postnatal life, but in prenatal uh, life as well. So uh, here um, is the slide that um, Clyde began with. There's my name lighting up again. And uh, on this uh, archaeology of biological embedding, can you see my cursor if I move it? Yeah, you can. Uh, it, we are trying to understand how the social circumstances of childhood become biologically embedded, and we begin with the level of the experience and, uh, of the child and the behavior of the child. We drill down to try to understand the neural circuitry that underpins that lived experience. We then try to understand, at, really at the level of cells and synapses, uh, how these things uh, happen. And finally, down at the level of gene expression, we're trying to understand the most fundamental basic biology of how early experience changes the trajectories of development uh, over the course of an entire uh, life. I am uh, wanting to make just three uh, reasonably simple points uh, this afternoon. The first is I want to give you a basic background uh, in epigenetics 100A. Um, it will be a, a very uh, truncated and um, simple version of how genes and environments and development work together. Um, it will completely exhaust my knowledge of molecular biology, but I think it will give you a, a, a sense of the uh, basic biology that we are uh, dealing with in this field. The second uh, point that I'd like uh, to make. Okay, this slide over talking to this one. Oh, are you hearing me okay? Okay. If you're not hearing the echo, it's because there aren't two mics on. It's just, just one. But I'll try to stand here so you can hear me. Uh, the second is I'd like to show you some examples of this, some examples of how genes and environments uh, work together to influence uh, development over the course not only of childhood but on into adulthood uh, as well. And I want to highlight a couple of uh, studies and findings that are emerging from the research that we're doing on gene environment interplay within the human early learning uh, partnership. And finally, I'd like to make the case to you that we are uh, in fact living in a truly historical moment in our pursuit of understanding disease origins. I think that this is really one of those moments in human biology that only comes around once every century or so, and I want to try to make the case to you that, that this is an exceptional time in the history uh, of the development of this science. So let me give you first a brief uh, history of how we think about disease causation. When I was a pediatric resident at UC uh, San Francisco back in the early uh, 70s, environmental determinism was very much uh, holding sway. Everything was thought of as coming from the environment, everything from infectious disease agents that live in the environment and impinge on the individual coming from the environment. We were actively taught that schizophrenia and autism came from cold, distant parenting. Um, really a, a, a terrible mistake, which for a whole generation of uh, parents uh, implicated them in ways that, were, that was completely unfounded uh, and, and was a, a fundamental mistake in our understanding. But it was a, it was a time of both uh, trying to understand more deeply and in, in certain ways trying to understand in ways that were misleading 
how the environment affects the etiology of disease. By the 80s, we uh, moved into a period of genetic determinism uh, with the advent of the, of the Human Genome Project, the, the beginning ability to sequence the human, the human genome and the sequence the genomes of uh, uh, experimental animals uh, on which um, various kinds of, uh, of experiments were being uh, done. But we very soon after the advent of this kind of period of genetic determinism realized that both of these are really only pieces of the pie, that both the genetic input into disease etiology and the environmental input are really only pieces uh, of the pie. And we began thereafter to try to reassemble this into a, a whole pie and fields like behavior genetics uh, really made their impact by trying to understand what proportion of the variance in a behavioral or mental health outcome was attributable to genetic determinism versus environmental determinism. So it was a kind of a, a period of partitioning variance into uh, genetic uh, forces and environmental forces. Since then, we have learned that it really isn't about simply the additive effects of genes and environments, but rather it has to do with the interplay, the intimate interplay of genes and environments uh, and a new field emerging that we call um, epigenetics. So in a sense, we have taken the family and moved the child uh, back into that social environment, be it a family, be it a neighborhood, be it a nation, uh, whatever. And we are now trying to understand the interaction between individual susceptibility driven by genetic uh, variation and the effects of the environment uh, driven by the characteristics of these iterative uh, social uh, environments. So how does this happen? Um, let me talk about this at two different levels of abstraction. The first is at the level of chromatin, which is the actual structure of the DNA, the, the, the configuring, the packaging of DNA. If you take a chromosome and you unravel it, you will discover that the DNA is actually like beads on a string. The string is the DNA, which is wrapped around these little octomers, these little clusters of eight uh, proteins, and together those form uh, a nucleosome, the DNA wrapped around the bead, which is the, this cluster of eight uh, proteins. So the structure underneath the chromosome, if you unraveled it, is this kind of beads on a string. Now it turns out that both the octomers of protein and the DNA itself can be modified chemically, shown here. The, uh, the protein octomers can be acetylated, methylated, phosphorylated, essentially little chemical tags that are added to those proteins. And the DNA itself, the nucleotide itself, uh, cytosine, can be methylated at this position in the structure of this particular uh, nucleotide. Now what that does is it changes the conformation of the DNA. In, the, uh, in one configuration, the DNA is relatively open. It's uh, got space between uh, the, the different nucleosomes. And in the other, it's quite tightly packed. The, the, the enzyme that is required to decode the DNA has to be able to get into the DNA. And so when you move from one configuration to another, it either allows or disallows the access of that enzyme to the DNA itself. We call this uh, relatively open active chromatin, and we call this silent condensed chromatin. And now I'm going to move to a slightly deeper level, to the level of the molecule, and help you try to understand how this methylation of DNA actually occurs. This is, of course, the helical structure of DNA that you're all familiar with. This is a, a coding region on a long uh, gene. And we know, and I think most of you know, that the first thing that happens in the activity of the gene is to move from the code of the DNA through transcription down to the code of the messenger RNA. Following that, there is a process called translation in which the code of the messenger RNA uh, arranges for the assembly of uh, a protein, and the protein are the enzymes and building blocks and functional units that really change the way that we function, uh, change the structure of our bodies as we develop. They're really the operative unit of developmental uh, change. Now, uh, a given gene has not only this coding sequence region, but it also has 
a starting point, kind of a start sign, and it has a stop sign. And in addition to that, it has a region called the promoter region, which functions as a kind of dimmer switch that either uh, increases the light or decreases the light, the light being the metaphor for the expression of this gene. So the promoter region controls the expression of this coding sequence. How does it do that? It does it by assembling a series of uh, different units and proteins, these called transcription factors. Here is the RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that decodes the DNA. When these come together into what's called a transcription complex, the RNA polymerase, the enzyme, is able to move across that coding region and in the process of that, decode the DNA and move it into uh, the transcription of messenger RNA. And there follows then the translation into the protein and the change in the function of the cell in which this is occurring. So what happens is that when children are exposed in differential ways to either hospitable or hostile social environments, there is a change in the production of these methyl groups, these little chemical methyl tags, which when attached to the promoter region, make it impossible for the, the, uh, the transcription factors to bind to this start site and make the expression of the DNA, the expression of the gene, go away. So how does this change in phenotype, these changes in the production of proteins, how does this actually happen? Well, we think it happens in the same way that these two butterflies develop different morphological features. These look like completely different species of butterflies. This one is light, this one is dark, this one has multiple little eye patterns in its bottom wings, this one does not. And in fact, these are the same species of butterfly. They are buckeye butterflies from uh, uh, the sort of mid part of uh, the North American continent. And this is a polyphenism, uh, a polyphenotype, if you will, that's driven by the temperature and the length of daylight when this butterfly emerges from the pupil stage. So this is a conditional adaptation, conditional because it's driven by the context in which uh, the, the uh, butterfly uh, emerges and uh, develops that involves differential epigenetic regulation of genes that determine wing coloration and pattern. So two very different looking phenotypes coming from the same species depending upon the kind of physical, uh, environmental, geological context in which uh, the butterfly uh, develops. So let me give you uh, some, ex some examples now of how this business of epigenetics, of changes that are brought about in the structure of the genome, are brought about by changes in the social environment. The most famous uh, example, and the one that really began the field that we are now responding to and trying to generate new human research on the basis of, is the work on the maternal behavior of the rat that was pioneered by Michael Meany and Moishe Jeff uh, at McGill uh, University. Uh, mother rats engage in uh, nursing behavior, and there is both uh, licking and grooming that goes on, as you see here, and then there is this characteristic arched back uh, nursing position that allows her pups uh, to get to her and to, um, and to nurse. And it turns out that the distribution of the amount of time that the mom rat uh, licks and grooms and engages in this arched back nursing position is highly variable from mother to mother. Turns out this is also true in human mothers. There are mothers who spend lots of time in physical contact with their, uh, with their human infants, and there are mothers who spend less time in contact with their human infants. And it turns out that this is a relatively normal uh, distribution with some rat mothers uh, grooming and licking a lot and other uh, um, rat mothers grooming and licking uh, little and a lot in between. What Moisha Jiff and Michael Meany were able to show is that when you look at the variability in parental licking and grooming, this gives way to and causes differences in DNA methylation at a promoter region of the glucocorticoid, the GR gene. This changes the expression of glucocorticoid receptor, which reprograms the cortisol, the stress response axis, uh, within the brain of the, of the newborn rat. 
This then uh, changes the behavior uh, of the individual newborn, causing more behavioral inhibition, more uh, predisposition to withdraw from novel uh, objects in, in its environment. These individuals then become relegated to subordinate social roles that when they become pregnant, they uh, also show a paucity of licking and grooming, and the whole cycle begins again. So here was a beautiful example in a rodent model of an epigenetic change coming from a maternal care characteristic that has an intergenerational perpetuation of this epigenetic uh, change. A second example, and now we're going to go into human examples, is the example of the Dutch famine from 1944 to 1945 during the Nazi um, uh, occupation of Holland. There was a food embargo that was imposed. This was at the end of World War II. Uh, it was in Western Holland. And there were 30,000 deaths in that population that were attributable to this blockade of food coming into Western Holland. But in addition to that, there were, as you can imagine, a number of babies who were in utero at the time of this uh, blockade. And there was fetal exposure to extreme hunger during intrauterine life. This resulted in a really an epidemic of low birth weight, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer in those fetuses that were then born and emerged with lifelong risks of these various forms of human morbidity. It also has been shown that this increased liability to these chronic medical conditions was true not only of the fetuses who were experiencing this during uh, the uh, Dutch famine, but their, uh, their children as well, so the grandchildren of the women who were pregnant uh, during this period of time. So a profound effect of a severe social and physical environment on the epigenetic uh, decoding, the epigenetic modification of the genome of those uh, fetuses. Clyde Hertzman and Moishe Jiff have just completed and recently published uh, a study on uh, based on the 1958 British birth cohort study. They looked at 40 adult males who were selected from the, the extremes of socioeconomic status, both in childhood and in adulthood. They looked at uh, genome-wide uh, methylation from blood DNA collected at age 45 years, and they used a, a technique of interrogating or analyzing 20,000 of those gene promoter regions uh, that I showed you in a previous slide. Here's what they find. Uh, first of all, shown in this uh, A um, figure that shows the promoter percent methylation, uh, there is a strong relation to gene expression uh, levels. So that those genes that were uh, uh, not methylated at all showed high expression, shown in the red, and those genes that were heavily methylated showed relatively low expression, shown in the green. They also show that the distribution of variably uh, methylated promoters across 23 chromosomes is highly variable. The down arrows here show the regions with many variably met methylated promoter regions, and the up arrows show those regions with very few uh, methylated uh, promoters. They found that there were over 9,000 variably methylated sites in 6,000 promoter regions of the genes that they looked at. And these methylation levels uh, for over 1,000 of the promoters were associated with childhood socioeconomic status. So for over 1,000 of these gene promoters, there was a relationship between experiences of socioeconomic disadvantage early in life and the degree of methylation in these various uh, gene promoters. And these variable methylation differences were in key cell signaling uh, pathways. So this, this work begins to reveal to us a kind of epigenetic signature of early exposure to impoverished uh, environments. One more example coming from the recent work of HELP. We have been working with an investigator by the name of Marilyn Essex, who is a professor in the uh, Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin. She uh, has spent most of her uh, professional life developing the Wisconsin Study of Families and Work which began with 570 uh, children uh, enrolled during intrauterine life, pregnant women and their partners. Uh, these uh, infants were followed on through. Now all of them have, uh, have uh, um, graduated from high school. 
and during the infancy and preschool periods of these children's development, they asked their parents about stressors occurring in their lives. This included symptoms of depression on the part of one or both of the parents, expressed anger, parenting stress, difficulty with managing the tasks of parenting, role overload, financial stress, and so on. So for both mothers and fathers, there was an assessment of stressors occurring in the lives of these uh, babies during infancy and during the three to five year preschool period. We then at age 15 in a subsample of these children did epigenetic profiling in buccal epithelial cells, the cells that, that you can scrape from the lining of the mouth. We used an aluminum microarray and we interrogated 28,000 methylation sites in 14,000 gene promoters. And here's what we are finding. And this just came out in an issue of child development uh, within the last um, uh, couple of months. We're finding that there are epigenetic vestiges of these early developmental adversities. This figure right here is uh, complex. Let me, let me uh, move you through it, explain it to you. These are the number of methylation sites differentially methylated. So it goes up here to 140 down to zero. Those that are hypermethylated are above the zero line. Those that are uh, hypomethylated or less methylated are shown below the line. And these stressors are divided into those that occurred in infancy and those that occurred at preschool. They're further divided into those that were reported by the mother and those that were reported by the father. And then finally, they're divided into all children, girls, and boys for each one of those uh, ramifications. Here's what we're finding we found that there was differential methylation of multiple CPG or methylation sites by parental stress in both infancy and preschool. You can see that there were multiple sites that were differentially methylated according to the amount of stress reported by the parent, either the mother or the father, 15 years uh, earlier. The mother's stressors were primarily related to uh, uh, mother stress stressors in infancy were those related to differences in methylation for both boys and girls. The father's stressors came into play in preschool and were associated with methylation differences primarily for girls. This is a pattern of influence of parents by gender that's commensurate with our prior knowledge of maternal versus paternal and gender specific influences on development. So here again, we see a kind of, if you will, an epigenetic remembrance of things past. A decade and a, and a half in the past, there were changes happening in the methylation of that child's genome that we see reflected uh, 15 years later. So the, the metaphor that has always been used in trying to understand the human genome is that it's a kind of blueprint with which we build a house, with which we create uh, development as human organisms. It is now turning out that a, a far richer metaphor, metaphor is closer to the truth, which is that we start with this blueprint, but it's almost as if the family moves into the house halfway through, there's a revision of the blueprint, and then finally the house is finished. It's as if there is this kind of feedback that happens as the child is growing that collects signals from the environment in which that child is growing and revises the blueprint for the development, the genetic development of that child over uh, the period of uh, growth and early development. We now have a, a whole constellation of studies that are exploring this phenomenon in, uh, in human uh, children. I won't go through all of these, but just to show you that with Michael uh, Kobor's lab uh, down at Children and Women's Hospital serving as the core um, uh, epigenetic laboratory, we are uh, in pursuing a number of different studies that explore this phenomenon of epigenetic modification uh, of development. So I want to end here by just noting to you that in the 19th century, uh, at the turn of the century between 1899 and 1900, the understanding of the human brain was basically like this uh, gelatinous uh, brain. It's actually jello. It was, it, it was the idea that the brain is made up just of this incision, this gelatinous mass that did elegant and important things, but wasn't, you couldn't break it down into smaller uh, units. It was, it was one big hole. 
Then the work of these two uh, people came along. Camillo Golgi was a, an Italian physician who developed the silver nitrate stain that for the first time allowed us to stain uh, slices of brain tissue. Santiago Ramoni Cajal was the famous Spanish neuroscientist who used Golgi's stain and began staining slices of brain tissue and showed for the first time that the brain was made up not of a big homogeneous gelatinous mass, but was made up of these individual units called neurons. And even more importantly, that these neurons communicated with each other at these points uh, along uh, their axons. And this really was the finding which was first presented at the 1889 German Anatomical Society that has given rise to all of modern neuroscience. Everything we now know about circuits of, of of neurons, about neurotransmitters and their effects on depression and anxiety, the drugs that we use to treat psycho, uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, all of these sprang from this fundamental change in locating the communication between these units uh, of, uh, of neural function. So I want to end by arguing that I think we are in a similar moment uh, historically in our understanding of human disease and disorder. Just like Santiago Ramoni Cajal was able to show the locus, the actual physical locus of the communication between neurons, we believe that these chemical tags that come from uh, experience and are attached to DNA, changing the conformation of the DNA, may be uh, the physical nexus of gene environment interplay, which we now know is the key feature of almost all of human uh, pathogenesis and uh, disorder. Thank you.